Welcome to this predicted paper from OnMaths. This paper represents the best guess for the upcoming exams. Please use this paper in addition to your other revision. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMath site. OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions, and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing. Enjoy! So if we do our place value grid, and so we've got uh, units here, tenths and hundredths, don't think we need any more. So we can put in our number, is it 5.87, and you can see here that the 8 here is in the tenths column, so the 8 represents 8 tenths. For us to create the largest number, we need to pick the biggest digits for the start of the number. So the biggest digit is 7, then 6, then 4, then 3. But the question says it wants the largest even number, so we need to just swap the last two around to make sure that it is even. So our answer is 7,634. For this question, it's really important that we understand what the words sum and product mean. Now, sum just means add, and product just means times. So we're going to start by adding the 5 and the 4, so that will equal 9. And then what we're going to do is find the product of 9 and 7, so we're going to multiply them together, 9 times 7, which is 63. So our answer is 63. If I split this shape into two sets of six blocks, when we're asked to shade in three sixths, for each one of those, or each set of blocks, I'm going to shade in three of the six. So that's three for the first set, and this is three for the second set. And that's our answer. Now you might notice that 3 over 6 is the same as a half, because you can divide on 1 by 3, and so all I need to do is shade in a half. Or you might convert 3 over 6 into 6 over 12, and there's 12 squares altogether, so it's 6 of the 12 squares. There's lots of ways of doing this question. I'm going to start just by writing down the number. And we're asked to round this to three significant figures. And that basically what that means is starting from the left-hand side, it's three numbers that we want. So one, two, three. And we're going to do our line on after that third number. And you start counting the first non-zero digit. So the first digit there was two, so we start to count in. Now all the numbers to the left, or sorry, to the right, so these numbers here, will all turn to zero. But before that happens, we look at this number. Now this number, if it's 5 or more, it moves this number up by 1. If it's less than 5, that number stays the same. Now it is 5 or more, because it is 5. So it's not going to be 207, it's going to be 208. Now, a common mistake is that students write down 208. No. All the numbers to the right of that line turn to 0. So it would be 0, 0, 0. So it would be... 20,000 or 208,000 exactly. So we're just going to start by write, writing the number a little bit bigger. So it says to two decimal places, so we're going to draw a line after the second decimal place. Now all the numbers to the right are going to disappear, they're going to turn to zero, and because it's a decimal, that just means we get rid of them. But we have to look at this number first. Now, if this number is less than 5, we just keep the number to the left, so 8.17. But if it's 5 or more, then this 7 goes up to an 8. So this will be 8.18. If we try to draw a quadrilateral with a pair of parallel sides... And then it's a quadrilateral, so we join them up. It's got four sides. Then the shape we draw will always be a trapezium. So our answer is that it is a trapezium. 
Now you might think that a rectangle and square do does have one pair of parallel sides, but it actually has two pairs of parallel sides. The definition of a trapezium is it has just one pair of parallel sides, and any quadrilateral that has one pair of parallel sides is a trapezium. First thing to do when working out what angle things need to be on a pie chart is to add up the frequencies. So we're going to do 14 plus 7 plus 3, and we find out that that's 24. Then we're going to find the angle that one item would be. So one item is going to be, well, there are 360 degrees in a triangle, and there are 24 items. So we're going to do 360 divided by 24, and that gives us 15 degrees. So each item is worth 15 degrees, or will take up 15 degrees. So to find out the angle for red, well, we've got 14 items, times it by 15, and that will give us 210 degrees. And we're just going to times each of these by 15, which will be 105. And the final one times 15 is 45 degrees. Add them up and they add up to 360, which is good. They need to add up to 360. So we got our protractor, rest it on the pie chart. Now we know 180 is down here. So the first thing we're going to do is just mark that on because the first angle is going to be 210. So we know that's 180 so far. So I'm going to turn my protractor around. And from 180, uh, 210 will be another 30. So I'm just going to plot that on. And then I'm going to join it up. So start at the center and join that up. And we're going to stop when the circle stops. Then to do 105, we're going to put our protractor in the middle. And we're going to look at 105, which will be up here. And then we're just going to join it up with a straight line. And then we're just going to check the last angle. And so if I put my protractor on it, and it is 45 degrees, perfect. Now, an important step to not miss is you need to label them. And so the first one is red, the second one is blue, and then the final one is other. First thing we need to do is work out the area of the wall. And so to do that, we're just going to multiply the 44 by the 40. So 44 times 40 is 1,600, sorry, 1,760. And next thing we notice is that each tin covers 10 meters squared. So it actually means we can work out the fact that there are 1,760 meters squared in total for our wall. And if each tin covers 10 meters squared, then we will need 176 tins. That's the amount of tins we need. And each tin costs £5.70, so it'd be 176 times the 5.7, or yeah, £5.70, or you could do it as 570 pence and convert it at the end. And that gives us a price of 1,003.2. And so as money, that would be 1,003 pounds 20. So we know that the mean is the sum of numbers over the amount. But in this question, we're actually given what the mean is. We're given that that is 29. We're also given the fact that there are four cards. So we're given the amount. So what we can do is just get our lines in and solve this. So what we're going to do is just times both sides by 4. So we're going to do 29 times 4, which is 116. And so we know that the sum of the numbers will be 116. So all we need to do is to find the fourth card, is get that 116 and just take away the numbers that we know. And when we do that, we get the answer 26. Now, you can easily check this by adding up 37, 26, 27, and 26 again, and then dividing it by 4, and you will get 29.
Let's rewrite this expression, but with a time sign in. So v times w squared. Now w squared just means times by itself. So we can rewrite that as v times w times w. Okay, so we know v is minus 10, so minus 10. And we know w is minus 4, so it's times minus 4 times minus 4. Okay, so when you multiply, it doesn't matter which order we do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do these ones first. And I'm going to ignore that minus uh, times minus 4 at the end. So minus 10 times minus 4, that's a minus times a minus, which is a positive. 10 times 4, which is 40, times minus 4. Now we're going to do 40 times minus 4. So it's a positive times a negative, so that's going to be a negative. And 40 times 4, well, 4 times 4 is 16, so 40 times 4 is 160. So it's going to be minus 160. A side elevation is the view you'd get if you were standing at the side of a shape. So I'm standing here, and it's the view I'll get. Well, it would be this trapezium here. And to know which side is the side and which one's the front, well, the front is always going to be labelled. They do normally label the sides as well for you. So we're going to draw this trapezium. So the top bit is 3, then it's 6, then it's 8. So I'm just going to start off with the bottom, actually. That might be easier. And draw the 8 across. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Then I'm going to do the 6 up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Looks like I left just enough room. Then I'm going to do the 3 across. 1, 2, 3. And then all I need to do is just join up the start and the finish to complete the trapezium. With these questions, we've just got to go around and fill in what we can. Um, and there's going to be some numbers like this one here we can't fill in yet, so we're going to have to be strategic in the order we do it. I'm going to first of all look here, and notice that the total of girls and boys is 29, the total of the boys is 18, so take away the 18 from 29 and we get 11. Uh, next one I'm going to fill out is this one. Uh, notice that the um, total for the green is 15, total for the boys who's picked green is 12, and therefore for the girls it's going to be 3. Um, then looking around, what's the next thing that we can fill out? We can fill out this one, because the total for the boys is 18. Green is 12, blue is 1, therefore we've got 5 left over. Then we can fill out this one, 2 plus 5 is 7. Uh, then we can fill out this one, so 2 plus 3 is 5, then plus another 6 would be 11, and then 6 plus 1 is 7. So if we look at the graph, this point here is by well, it's the biggest. This one comes close, but it's not the biggest. So the biggest would be this one. And if we draw a line down from there. Now we might think that it's enough to say Q4, but actually there's two Q4s here. So we must state the year as well. So Q4 in the year 2000. We're going to start off by writing the numbers that the dots are at. So we've got minus 12 and we've got minus 5. And x is anywhere between those. Now, it's obviously going to be greater than minus 12. And it's going to be less than minus 5. But it can equal minus 12. And the reason for that is it's a filled in dot. But it can't equal minus 5 because that is a hollow dot. There's a formula we use for this. And it is percentage change is equal to the amount that's changed over the original amount and all of that times 100%. So how much has changed here? Well, we need to do um, 10,488 10, take away 10,254. So that would be 234, divided by the original. So the original was 10,488, because it's decreased from that amount. And then times by 100%. And so that's going to be 2.23%.
It's really important when answering this question that we're really methodical. So we're going to start off just looking at steak. And I'm, so I'm going to start off with the S. And we're going to pair it with the first dessert, which is the I. Then we're going to pair the steak with the second dessert, which is the mousse. Then we're going to pair it with the third dessert, which is the fruit. So we're being really methodical. We've done all of the combinations with steak. And so we're going to look at burger next. And we're going to pair it with the first ice cream. Then burger. And we're going to pair it with the mousse. And then finally the burger we're going to pair with the fruit. As long as we do things methodically, we don't ever miss any. There are a number of different ways of working out this question. Uh, you can find out the amount of tissues per penny. Uh, you can work out the amount of, uh, or the price of one tissue, or you can get all the amount of tissues into the same amount. I'm going to find out the price per one tissue. And we're going to start off with the 24. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the money into pence just to mean, mean that we don't have as much decimal. And we're going to do 807. I'm going to divide by the 24 to find out the price of one tissue. So that is 33.625. And so I'm just going to round that to um, 33.63. I'm just going to round everything to two decimal places, which says in the question. Next one, we're going to do the 20 soft tissues. So this time I'm going to do 683 divided by 20. When I put that into the calculator, 34.15, so that's already two decimal places. And then finally we're going to do the 15 soft tissues. So we're going to do the 623 divided by 15 to find the price per tissue. It should be 41.533 blah blah blah. And rounded would be 41.53. So if you buy 15 tissues it will cost 41 pence. 20 tissues it will be 34 pence per tissue but 24 tissues will be 33.63 so that's by far the cheapest the best value is the uh, is the 24 tissue tissues box now there's such thing as um, buying in bulk <clears throat> generally when you, the more you buy of something the cheaper it is don't rely on that um, both in the GCSE, both in the exam, and in real life. Sometimes in real life, if you buy uh, more of an item, actually per tissue, sometimes it becomes more expensive, especially if there's a special offer on the smaller box. So we're going to track the amount of eggs to make the amount of, or to make each amount of omelette. So five eggs makes 17 omelettes. And we're just going to find out how much is required, how many eggs is required to make one omelette. So we divide that by 17, divide both sides by 17. And so one omelette would be 0 0.294 blah 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 eggs. Next we want to see how many for 67 omelettes. And to get to 67 from 1 times 67, so do that to the amount of eggs. And we get 19.705, blah, blah, blah. Now, you can't get 0 0.705 of an egg. We always round with eggs. And we always round upwards, because if you need 19.7, 19 won't be enough. So we need to pick 20 eggs. In this question, we've got euros and we've got pounds. And we're told that uh, one pound is 2.23 euros and we're trying to get to understand what 2,676 euros is in pounds and we're going to do that by finding out what one euro is and then finding out how uh, much uh, 2,676 are. So to get from uh, 2.23 to 1 we divide by 2.23 and we're going to do that on both sides. And when we do that, we get 0 0.448, blah, blah, blah. And then to get from 1 to 2,676, we are times by 
2,676 on both sides. And when we do that, we get 1,200 pounds. So 2,676 euros is 1,200 pounds. So we've got to first of all find out what the gradient is for our graph. So we're just going to pick two points and draw a triangle between them. So I'm just going to pick this point here and this point here. And there's no reason I pick those. I just pick those at random. And we look at how far it's going to cross. So it's going to cross 10. How far it's gone up. So it's gone from 24 to 36. So it's gone 12 up. And to work out the gradient, which you can call N, or you can just write out the word gradient, it's change in Y over change in X. So how much has Y changed over how much has X changed? So Y is this one here, so it's changed by 12, and X has changed by 10. So it's 12 divided by 10, which is 1.2. Now a gradient represents the amount of change in the Y per one change in the X. So for every one mile we travel, we're going to go up, it's going to cost 1.2 more. So the interpretation that we give for this context, because this is about taxis, is that the taxi will cost £1.20 or 120 pence per one unit on the X per mile. And that's true for the gradient for any context. It's for every one of this, how much of this increases, how much the Y increases by. So we can quickly draw a line of best fit for here. And it looks something like that. And if our line of best fit is increasing like we have here, then we say the data is positive. If, however, the line of best fit is decreasing and looks like this, we say that it's a negative correlation. So positive if it's going up, which this one is. So it's a positive correlation. And if it's going down, then it's a negative correlation. If um, the data is all over the place, so it looks like something like this, where you've got the points everywhere, we say that's no correlation. The midpoint of a line is the halfway point, and we can see that it is roughly here. And there's a couple of different ways we can work this out. Either we can just look at the graph and just kind of try and work it out that way, or we can use the equation. Now the equation is, to find the midpoint for the x, what we do is we add the two x coordinates together and we divide by 2. And so the x coordinate of a is uh, 3 and at b it's 0. It's going to be 3 plus 0 divided by 2, which is 1.5, 1.5. So we know that's going to be 1.5. I'm going to do the y a slightly different way, maybe. We're at, we've gone from minus 3 to 2. And so we can just look at the fact that the halfway point here is going to be at minus a half. That's going to be minus 0.5. If you didn't really see that, we can use the equation. The equation is simple because it's just y1 plus y2 divided by 2. And so the y coordinates are 2 and minus 3. 2 plus minus 3 is just going to be minus 1. Minus 1 over 2 is just going to be minus a half. To find out what the value of x is, we first of all have to find out what the value of y is. And we can notice that we've got two sets of parallel lines here and here, and a line going through them. And we kind of got these f angles, which we have to call corresponding angles. So we know that 2y minus 50 is equal to 78 and we must write down the reason so corresponding corresponding angles um, and corresponding angles are equal now here we've got um, an equation and we want to solve it so we get our lines in we go first of all um, add 50 to both sides so we've got 2y equals 
78 plus 50, which would be 128. And then we're going to halve both sides. We'll divide by 2. So we've got 64. So we know that y is 64. And so we look back at the um, diagram to find out how we'd work out x. Well, what we can do, there's a few different things we can do. Um, we could work out the fact that these two here are vertically opposite. That would be absolutely fine. But actually, if we look at this um, part here and this part here, these are also two parallel lines. And we've got this um, angle here and this angle are going to be alternate. So I can write that down here. So angle ECB is equal to 78 degrees. So this will be 78 degrees. And the reason for that is alternate angles. And then finally, if we know this is 78 and we know that this is 64, because we know what y is, then we can work out what x is. So x equals 180 angles in a triangle, take away the 78 we know and the 64 we know. And the reason for that is angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. And just make sure you write down all the reasons as you go. And when we take away the 78 and the 64 from 180, you get 38. So x is therefore 38 degrees. To find the exterior angle of any polygon, we do 360 divided by the amount of sides. These are decagons, which means they have 10 sides. So the exterior angles will be 36 degrees. And the exterior angle is just an angle that kind of continues on, you just continue on from the side. So this one here is the exterior angle of the left-hand decagon, and this one here is the exterior angle on the right-hand decagon. So altogether, um, the angle A will be 36 plus 36, which will be 72. So our answer will be 72 degrees. The first thing we need to do is work out the area of the floor. And you'll notice that this is a trapezium. So with a trapezium, it, the formula is half a, B, uh, a plus B times H. And A and B are the parallel sides. So these ones are the parallel sides. And the height is the one connecting the two um, bases, the two parallel sides. So we're going to start off by writing down the formula. So it would be half A plus B H. So half times uh, 2.8 plus 1.2 times 11. And when we do that, we get 22. So the area of the floor is 22 meters squared. And it says here that the tiles are sold in packs which cover 3 meters squared. So if each pack covers 3 meters squared, we're going to do 22 divided by 3 which will be 7.33 packs that we need. Now obviously you can't get a 0.3 of a pack or 0.33 of a pack. So we're going to have to get eight packs and just have some left over. So we'll need eight packs in total. Okay, the next thing we um, look at is the fact that the uh, Jenny has a 25% discount. Um, so we need to find out what um, 25% discount would do to the £18.60 for the tiles or for the pack of tiles and so what we're going to do is we're going to get the £18.60 and we're going to times it by 0 0.75 so we're just going to find um, three quarters of it because she has a 25% discount and that would be 1395 so that's um, the uh, tiles are going to cost £13.95. Um, now I've done this in pence and I've kind of muddled it together here. So really let's just go back because I've kind of done this in pence. So that would be uh, 1,860 times 0 0.75. And so 
each pack will cost 1395 and the reason we're doing this in pence is the answer needs to be given in pence uh, so i might as well just make that conversion now and so it's going to be eight lots of the 1395 pence packs which will cost in total 11,160 pence or 111 pound 60 but Jenny has a hundred pounds to spend and we're asked how much extra does she need so we're going to do the 1,000 sorry 11,160 take away the 10,000 pence that she has which will give us 1,160 pence so she needs to find £11.60 or £1,160 pence from somewhere. So the first thing we're going to do is work out the area of the trapezium. And the formula for that is half brackets A plus B times H. Now A and B have to be the parallel sides. So here we've got the um, two parallel sides here. Show, just pick a different colour here and here so that is A and B and then the H is the um, perpendicular distance between them so perpendicular means it hits it at right angles so that's what we've got here so the area would be half times A which is 28 plus B which is 14 times the height which is 14 and so that would be 294. Next we'll do the circle. Now it doesn't look like we've got um, anything for the circle, but actually the height here is actually the height of the circle as well. So the height of the circle is the same as the diameter. So the diameter of the circle is 14. Therefore the radius would be half of that, which is 7. And the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. So it will be pi times 7 squared, which will be 153.938, blah, blah, blah. Now I'll keep that in my calculator, because next thing we'll do is the shaded area part. Um, and it says we want to work out the area of the shaded region. So the area will be... The total area, which will be the trapezium, take away the area that we don't want, which is this bit here, which will be the circle. So the trapezium is 294, the circle is 153.93, blah, blah, blah. And when you do that, you get 140.061, blah, blah, blah. It says it wants it to two decimal places. So it would be 140.06. So factorise means to put it into a bracket. And it looks like it's a quadratic here, um, but it's actually just a linear factorising um, because we don't have a number term. So we're going to just use one bracket for this. And looking at these terms, I'm going to focus first on the numbers. So 20 and 30, I can divide both of those by 10. And that will leave uh, 2 and 3. So that's the numbers done. Next I'm looking at the t terms. So we've got t squared there and a t there. So we can divide out a t. But that will leave a t on the first term. And finally I'm going to look at the u. And there's just a u on both of them I can factorise out. And actually that just leaves nothing on the inside of the bracket. Now, always when you do this, expand the bracket to check if you've made any mistakes. So I'm going to do smiles and rainbows. There's loads of different methods. So 10 times 2 is 20. t times t is t squared. And then the u plus 10 times 3 is 30 times t times u. So we know we've got the right answer. So our answer is 10t u brackets 2t plus 3. There's a few different methods to find product prime factors, but I prefer using the bubble method. So we put a circle around 75, and we want to split it up into two numbers, so two numbers that multiply together to make it. I always pick the smallest that I can think of, which is normally two, but in this occasion, um, the easiest one for me um, would be five. 
I think also three goes into it, but five to me seems nice and easy. It doesn't always have to be the smallest that I pick. So five times what is 75? Well, five times 15 is 75. And then to make 15, we're going to do three times five. And the reason why I've done some of these bubbles in red is that those are the prime factors, which means they, well, they can go, go to one and five. But if you do one and five, you'll be there all day. So we always stop when we um, do uh, the prime numbers. And so we're going to write these in a list. So three, five, and five. The product means that we put a time sign between them. But if you notice here, we've got five times five. So a different way of writing that in index form is five squared. So our answer will be three times five squared. So if we imagine we've got the um, 25 meter pipe here, and we've got the uh, 35 meter pipe here, the question is basically asking us what can we cut all these um, pipes into and they all have to be the same length um, that will fit with the 25 meter and the 35 meter and essentially what this question is asking is what is the highest common factor of 25 and 35. So to find the highest common factor what we do is we just find the factors of 25 which is 1 and 25 and 5 and 5 and the factors of 35, which will be uh, 1 and 35, and 5 and 7. And the highest common factor is the number in both lists, the highest number in both lists, so it's 5. So what we can do is we can cut all of these um, pipes into 5 metre pipes. So uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 to scale <laughs> and then seven of these so one two four five six and so there's seven in total so each of these are five meter long and there's no wastage and that's the longest we can we can make the pipes for there to be no wastage at all so my answer is five meters integer just means whole number so we're looking for all the whole numbers that satisfy these two inequalities. Well, the first inequality says that it has to be greater than three. So the smallest number that is greater than three is four. The second uh, inequality says it has to be less than or equal to eight. So I'm just gonna keep going until I get to a number that is less than or equal to eight. It can't be nine because nine is not less than or equal to eight. So our answer is four, five, six, seven, and eight. So we're going to start off with um, x equals 0, and we're going to write out this equation, but with 0 every time it says x. So it's going to be y equals 0 squared minus 0 plus 10. Well, 0 squared is just 0, so 0 take away 0 is just 0, plus 10 is just going to be 10. So the answer there would be 10. We do the same for 1. So it'll be 1 squared minus 1 plus 10. Well, 1 squared is 1, 1 take away 1 is 0, plus 10 is 10, so that will also be 10. 2 squared minus 2 plus 10. 2 squared is 4, 4 take away 2 is 2, plus 10 will be 12. Now we're going to do the negative, so we're going to look at minus 1. So it's y equals minus 1 squared, and it's going to be minus minus 1 plus 10. So a little bit more complicated here. Minus 1 squared is just 1. Now here you have two negatives together. When you have two negatives together, it makes a plus. So we've got 1 plus 1 plus 10, which is going to be 12. And then we'll do the minus 2. So it'd be minus 2 squared minus minus 2 plus 10. So minus 2 squared is 4. The two minuses here make a plus. So it'd be plus 2 be six, uh, 6, plus 10 will be 16. So we're going to plot these on our graph. And so we've got uh, minus 2 is 16, so that'll be there. Minus 1 is at 12, which will be here. 0 is at 10, 1 is at 10. 
and 2 is at 12. Okay, when you join this up, things to be aware of is you need to make sure that you have a round U at the bottom and not a flat bottom. Okay, so you want to avoid a flat bottom. Um, you also want to make sure that you avoid feathering like that. You want just one nice smooth line. And my recommendation is always to turn the page on its side. I don't have that luxury, so I'm going to try my best with this. But you need to make sure it goes through all the points. And here's the part here where it goes beneath those two points. So make sure it goes beneath those two points. On most exams, I see them, What basically what they do is they draw a line across from those two points and say that the line needs to go beneath that or your your curve needs to go beneath that line. So they're looking out so that you've gone beneath the line. Um, we can keep this as an interior angle, but it's actually sometimes easier to convert it to an exterior angle. And what you might know is that the sum of interior and exter exterior angles is going to be 180, because they will always form a straight line. So to find the uh, exterior angle, all we need to do is 180, take away the 170, and that means it will be 10 degrees. So we've already done a, f a different formula for exterior angle, which is 360 divided by n. And something we can do is we can just swap these two things around. And so we can make the formula that n equals 360 divided by the exterior angle. So 360 divided by the exterior angle, well, we know that the exterior angle is 10. Therefore, n is 360 divided by 10, which would be 36. We can't work out what x is straight away, but we can um, find this value here. And we know with Pythagoras, we can find a third length if we've got other two in a right angle triangle. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared and A and B were labelled. C is always opposite the right angle, so it would be 49 squared plus B squared equals 68 squared. And 49 squared is 2,401. And 68 squared is 4,624. So we are solving here, so let's get our lines down. And we're going to start by um, subtracting the 2,401 from both sides. So we've got b squared equals 2,223. Then we're going to square root both sides, and we've got b, b equal to 47.148, blah, blah, blah. OK, we're now looking at the second diagram. And this time, we're going to have a. We've got our b, and we're going to call x the c. So it would be a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but this time a is 39. b we are given as 47.148, we've just worked that out, and we're looking for c. In fact, we can call it x now. Okay, so oh, we need to square that. So we do 39 squared plus 47.148 squared, and that will be uh, 3,000. 744 equal to x squared and we'll just get our lines in because we need to square root both sides and we get 61.188 blah 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 is equal to x it says it wants it to two decimal places so that would be 61.19 so to find the area of a rectangle, we just multiply the width and the length. That's what we're going to do here. But whenever you have an expression representing a length or a width or, or anything really, you just put brackets around it. So we go u minus 2 times u plus 9. Okay, and the way we do this is with our grid. And... Just going to draw out the grid. Uh, 
and so we've got u minus 2, and we're multiplying it by u plus 9. Don't want too many for some reason. And so we've got u times u, which is u squared, u times minus 2, which is minus 2u, 9 times u, which is 9u, and 9 times minus 2, which is minus 18. And what we're going to do is we're just normally going to be able to add these ones together. So our answer will be u squared, and then we're going to do 9u plus minus 2u. Well, that's just going to be 9u take away 2u, which is 7u. So plus 7u, and then minus 18 at the end. So here we're asked to factorise a quadratic, and we know it's a quadratic because it's got an x squared term, an x term, and a number term. And what we're going to do is we're going to be, first of all, putting two sets of brackets down with an x at the start of each. And what we're trying to find is what number goes here and what number goes here. So we can start by looking at this minus 45. And it's a special number because we're looking for two numbers that multiply together to make that minus 45. We're also going to look at this plus 12 here because we're looking for two numbers that add together to make that 12. So what we can do is write out the factors of minus 45. And so that's going to be minus 1 and 45, minus 3 and 15, minus 5 and 9, and then the same but the other way around. So 1 and minus 45, 3 and minus 15, and 5 and minus 9. Remember we're looking for them to add together to make 12. So we look down the list here, which ones add together to make 12. This one here, minus 3 plus 15 is 12. So our answers will be minus 3 and plus 15, or the other way around. So with each of these uh, pools, try and imagine it being filled. So pool A, first of all, we've got water coming into it, and it's actually going to go quite quickly initially, and then it will hit a point at the end where actually it will go really quite slowly because it's a wider pool. So we would imagine that the graph for pool A would actually go quite quickly at the start and then at the end it would go much slower. And that doesn't really describe, the, the graph, the red graph doesn't really describe that at all. So for pool B, we start off actually quite quickly because it's, um, it's quite thin and then we have a wider bit here so it will go slower here and then we go quickly again. So we need a graph that starts off quite quickly, then goes slowly, and then goes quickly. And the steeper the graph on our depth time graph, the faster it's filling up. And that red line doesn't really describe that either. Pool C, however, we can see it goes slowly at the start. And then because it's thin, it will go quicker. So nice quickly. And then it will go slowly again. Well, that is a perfect description of the graph that we're given. So the graph we're given is definitely going to be for pool C. So let's write these numbers out. And the first thing to do is um, work out what the numbers are going up by. So it's they're going up by minus 3. Because they're minusing 3 each time. So we know that the number before the n is going to be minus 3. So whatever they go up in is the number before the n. Then what we do is we go backwards to find the zeroth term. So actually going backwards we would add 3 and we would find it to be 20. So whatever numbers our zeroth term, because 17 is our first term, is going to be what we add to the minus 3n. So it's going to be add 20. So our answer is minus 3n plus 20. So we're going to write an expression for the amount of people on the first bus. So they've started with x passengers and they've gone to 11 bus stops with x passengers. So all together that is 12x. So we're going to have the first bus. And so we've got 12x and then on the last bus stop, 19 passengers get on, so plus 19. Now for the second bus, well, we start with x, and a further 5x come on, because 5 bus stops with x passengers, so that's 6x altogether, and then 79 get on. 
and it says the first bus finishes with less passengers than the first. So the first bus finishes with less. And the way we show that is with this inequality here. Now all we need to do is solve that inequality. And we've got x on both sides, so we look at the x's. We've got 12x and 6x, so we always take away the smaller amount. So we're going to take away the 6x both sides. And next thing we could do is take away the 19 from both sides. And so, ooh, meant to be 60, got ahead of myself. And the last thing we do is divide by 6, both sides. And so we've got x is less than 10. Now, it says here, assuming no passengers got off either bus, what is the largest value for x? Now, it is tempting to write down 10, but it says x has to be less than 10. So the biggest number we can get that is less than 10 is 9. So the only way of answering this question is to work out what these are as ordinary numbers. And so 7 times 10 to the power of 7 would be 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And 9 times 10 to the power of 4 would be uh, 90,000. So that would be 9, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so we're just subtracting them like that. And so we'll get uh, 6, 9, 9, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And obviously if this is on the calculator paper, just type it into your calculator. There are no tricks here. You can't do anything with the 7 and the 9. You're not subtracting powers or anything. You're just literally typing in what it says. Um, and there's a button on the calculator like that that you will need um, to use. So if you don't know what that is, ask your teacher or ask someone um, to help you out with that. We can write the equations of all linear graphs as y equals m x plus c with m being the gradient and c being the y-intercept. The easiest thing to find is the y-intercept because it's just where the line crosses the y-axis so that's going to be minus 2. We're going to use that point so the point we've just drawn on and we're going to have to find another point to find the gradient now, I don't really like this point because I don't really know where that is. And we've got to find a coordinate we know the coordinates for. So looking at this, this is a nice coordinate here. And what I'm going to do is just draw a right angle triangle between the two points. Try and get it as nice as I can. And we're going to work out how far up and how far right we went. Well, we went three right and four up. Now, to find the gradient, what we want to do is we find out how much y has changed, so change in y, so that's how far up it's gone, which is 4, and put that over how far right it's gone, so the change in x, which is going to be 3. So our equation is going to be y equals 4 over 3 x minus 2. So to find our new triangle coordinates, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look and see what we have to do to get from the centre of enlargement to each of the corners of A, or the vertices of A. So to get from the centre of enlargement to this coordinate, we go left 2. But it says scale factor 3, so instead of going left 2, scale factor 3 would be 2 times 3, it's going to go left 6. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the new coordinate for our shape is going to be here. We're going to do the same to the other part, so up, two, three, four, and four times three is going to be twelve, so four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then we've got to go left two to line it up with our coordinate here, and so we'll go left six, so what, two, three, four, five, six our new coordinates here. The bottom right one's just going to be a shared one because it doesn't go anywhere. So we draw in our new shape and 
there we go. And it says to label it B, so I'll put a B in it. We have our everything list here. Now these are all the numbers that go into our Venn diagram. And in A is all the square numbers. So we're going to have a look and see which square numbers we've got. Well, we've got 1 and we've got 4. And we've got 9. And we've got 16. Are all square numbers. So in here is 1, 4, 9 and 16. And we're going to look at all the odd numbers. So we've got 3. We've got 17, we've got 1, and we've got 9. Now in both the lists, we've got the 1 and 9, so that's going to go in the middle. Um, just the square numbers are 4 and 16, and just the odd numbers are 3 and 17. Now notice we've got the 2 and the 6 there, and those will just be on the outside. To find an error interval, what we need to do is find the smallest and largest that a number can be. So I start by just drawing a quick number line, and we put our number in the middle, which is 89.6. Now we're looking to the nearest tenth, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the next number down and the next number up in tenths. So the next number down would be 89.5, the next number up would be 89.7. Now the bounds, the upper and lower bound, the maximum and minimum number it could be before rounding, are going to be at the halfway points. So here and here. And so all we need to do is work out what those numbers are. So halfway between 89.5 and 89.6 is 89.55. And halfway between 89.6 and 89.7 is 89.65. So those are going to be our lower and upper bounds. But how do we show it as an error interval? Well, we put t in the middle because it tells us that t is representing the time. And we show it with inequalities. Now, the number can be 89.55, but it can't be 89.65 because that would round to 89.7. So we say everything that's less than but not equal to. There's a lot going on with this question, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in all of the time signs that we don't normally show. So we've got 10 times 12x times y to the power of 4 times 13 times x to the power of 4 times y to the power of 4. And I'm going to reorder these to put the numbers together, first of all. And with multiplying, it doesn't matter which way around you do it, so I'm not changing anything. I'm going to put the x's together. And I'm going to put the y's together. So, first thing to do is 9 times 13, which is just 117. Then we've got x to the power of 12 times x to the power of 4. Now we know when we multiply two powers of the same base, and the base is x on both of those, we just add the powers. So it's 12 plus 4, which is 16. So it'd be x to the power of 16. And then y to the power of 4 times y to the power of 4, we just add them together, so it's y to the power of 8. To find the perimeter of this sector, we've got to first of all find out the length of the arc, which will be this part here. And the formula for arc length is, first of all, we find out the fraction of the circle we have. So we put the angle over 360, and that will tell us the fraction of the um, circle that the sector is. And then all we do is we times that by the circumference, which is pi d. And so uh, that's going to be 49 over 360 times pi times, and the diameter would be twice the radius. The radius is 7, so it would be times 14. When we do all of that, we get 5.986, blah, blah, blah. But that is not the perimeter yet. Perimeter needs to include ooh, the right ones. Needs to include these parts here. So the perimeter will be the 5.986 plus a radius plus another radius. And when we do that, we get 9.0. 
19.986, blah, blah, blah. And we want to round it to two decimal places, so that will be 19.99 centimetres. First thing we need to do is work out the volume of this uh, prism. And it's a trapezium-based prism. Uh, so the volume will be the area of the cross-section, or area of the trapezium, times the length, how 3D the um, prism is. So trapezium is half A plus B H, and then times the length. Now A and B are the two parallel sides, which will be this one and this one. And then um, the H is the perpendicular line that, that hits both of them at 90 degrees, which is what perpendicular means, between the bases. So this will be the 25 meters here. So it's going to be half, and then we're going to add 1 and 5, times that by 25. The length is how 3D it is, so it would be that 10 there. So we're going to times that by 10 and that will give us 750. So it's 750 meters cubed. Now, um, there is a little formula we can make for the rate. So the rate of anything uh, for this will be um, the volume gained over time. Now, with this question though, we're interested in the time it will take. It says how long will it take? So we're actually looking at the time. So it will be time equals the volume, which is 750, over the rate, which is 15. So 750 divided by 15 is 50. So it will take 50, and let's have a look. It says per minute. So it would be 50 minutes. So what's happened here is that the company's increased the amount of sweets by 15%. So we're just going to focus on that and work out what the multiplier would be first. So they started off with 100% and they added 15% and then they, so therefore they ended up with 115%. And to find that as a multiplier, we get the 115 and divide it by 100 and that gives us 1.15. So that is the multiplier they used. Now, they used that multiplier on the original amount, and they timesed it by 1.15, and they got the answer of 69. But if we're working the other way to find out what they times by 1.15, we get that 69, and we divide it by the multiplier. So if we want to work out what the original number was, we divide it by the multiplier, and that gives us 60. So the answer will be 60. To be able to work out this question, we need to work out the amount of student hours required to paint the wall. And to work that out, we've got six students and it takes them 11 hours. So six times 11 means it's gonna take 66 student hours. So if we had one student, it would take 66 hours. Two students would be half of that because they share the work and etc etc so here we've got six students and take 11 hours and it says how long will it take seven um, students well if they're 66 hours or student hours but they're sharing the time we just divide 66 by 7 so 66 divided by 7 is 9.428 blah 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 and it says it wants its two decimal places so it'll take them 9.4 three hours. Now check this makes sense. We've got six students and it takes them 11 hours. So we'd think if we had more students helping to paint the wall, it would take less hours. So we've gone from 11 hours to about nine and a half. So that sounds right. So this question is a simultaneous equations question. And so we're going to have to write down some equations. So it says two apples and three pears cost £3.80. So two apples, I'm going to call it A, A for the price of an apple, plus three pears, so 3P, cost £3.80. Now I'm going to do this as 380 just because it's easier to work with integers rather than decimals. And it says three apples, so 3A, plus eight pears, cost £7.80. 
or 780 pence. Okay, so the first thing I do is try and get these numbers the same. So 3 and 8, um, they both go into 24. So I need to make them both 24. And what some people do is they just label this A and this B. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to multiply everything in equation A by 8 so that this becomes 24. So it's going to become 8A. And so we go times the 2A by 8, which will be 16A plus 24P. And 380 times 8 is 3040. And we're going to do the same with B, but this time we're going to times it by 3. So we're going to have 3B. And we're just going through everything here and we're timesing it by 3. So 9A plus 24P, which is good. That's what we wanted. And 780 times 3 is 2340. So now we've got both of these the same coefficient. What we can do is we can eliminate going downwards. Now, if they are the same, the S in same is the S in subtract. If they were different signs, so if these weren't both positive, if one of them was negative, different, the D in different is the D in add. So here they are the same, so we are going to subtract, and we're going to subtract going downwards. So we're going to start off by doing, and I can just do a little line here to show what we're doing. So we're subtracting going downwards, and we're going to do 16a take away 9a, which will be 7a. 24p take away 24p, which is nothing, which is why we did that, is to eliminate them. And then 3040 take away 2340 will be 700. Then I can put my lines in. And all I need to do now is just divide both sides by 7. And I get A equals 100. So we know that apples cost 100, or 1 pound. We need to work out what pears cost. So I just need to pick one of the equations. I'm just going to pick this top one here. And I'm going to write it out. But instead of A, we know that A is a pound, or 100 pence. So plus 3P equals 380. So that's going to be 200 plus 3P is 380. And then again, I'm just going to draw my lines down. And we're going to subtract 200 from both sides. So it's going to be 3P equals 180. And then we're going to just divide by 3 both sides. And we've got P equals 60. So a pair costs 60. Now we can check this by using the other equation there. So 3 times 100 is 300, plus 8 lots of 60 is going to be, was that 480? So that's going to be 780. So we know that we've got it right. Okay, so we're going to start off by working out the multiplier. And we're told, uh, we always start off with 100%, we're told that the compound interest rate is 1.6%. So we're going to add 1.6% to the 100%. And it's going to be 101.6%. Okay, make that into a decimal by dividing it by 100. So we're just going to divide that by 100. And this will give us the decimal or the multiplier. So the multiplier is 1.016. And so any time we want to increase something by 1.6%, we just times it by 1.016. Now, we're told that we start off with 2,400. It's our original amount. And to find out what it's um, going to be in the savings account at the end of the first year, we just times it by the multiplier, 0 0.1, uh, 0 1.016. But we're told that it's for seven years that it's going to be in there. So we then times it by 1.016 seven times, or easier way of doing it is 1.016 to the power of seven. When we do that, we get 2,682.052, blah, blah, blah. And because it's money, we ran to the nearest pence. So 2,682.05. So we've got a right angle triangle here, and we've got two lengths and an angle that are involved in the question. So that means we're going to be using trigonometry. And we're going to start by labeling the sides. So the one opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse. The one opposite the marked angle is the opposite. And the one between the right angle and the marked angle are is the adjacent. 
Now we're not using the adjacent here, so we're going to cross that out. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do our Sokatoa triangles. And so S O H Sokatoa. Just the right. Um, now, because we crossed out the H, we can cross out the uh, triangles that have a H in. So we're left with SO, and SO is short for sine x equals O over H. And so writing that in, well, the angle is x, and the O is 1.5, and the H is 2.3. And let's get our solving lines in. And what we're going to do is we're going to do the opposite of sine both sides. So we get x sine sine. The opposite of sine is called the inverse sine. Which looks like that. And you normally press the shift button on your calculator and then sine. So when you inverse sine 1.5 over 2.3, we get 40.705, blah, blah, blah. And two decimal places, which it asks us for, that would be 40.71 degrees. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMath site. OnMath is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions, and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing.